morning, everyone. How are you? I'm Jeannie Allen, and I am so pleased to be leading the third in our virtual education series uh, with CER, Accelerating Change Through Innovation and Opportunity Now. Hopefully you can all see me. You probably heard us just telling our dog to get out of the room. I also had to, um, hey, John, how are you? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put your video off just so we can do this the proper way, like we're on professional television. Um, <laughs> you probably uh, heard the outside, the people are like blowing the lawn. I'm walking around trying to tell them to stop. Um, in any event, I'm so pleased to have you all and if I could please have uh, our creative guys give us full screen, that would be awesome. And um, we will get this show started. As I said, I'm super happy to have all of you with us today in um, this event. It is not a happy um, day in the sense that we're all still stuck and confined at home. Um, but even those who are confined at home, our experiences don't compare to what our students, our families, and our educators in particular are going through all across the country. And so I think those of you who are here, the hundreds of you, and we're so grateful, um, would all agree that um, our ability to drive change for them is critical. And so before I jump in with our first of our two change makers for the morning, <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't start out by putting some um, strong and controversial thoughts out there for you which is why do we have to wake up to a New York Times article about how much the teachers unions are driving um, educators not to teach. We understand things are difficult. Uh, we understand that uh, working, it's working, um, we're all working harder than ever before as AFT President Randy Weingarten said today in the article by Dana Goldstein and Eliza Shapiro, um, but we're all working hard and our kids have to come first. And you know what folks, we're Americans and we can do this. Um, we can fight and we can make sure both educators, families and students get what they need if we try. So today CER published uh, the first of our Future of School series. We are recommending some bold actions based on having looked at, studied and analyzed for the past five weeks, what's going on out there and it turns out there are people doing education well and right by kids. And so with that, as a proviso, let me bring on John H., uh, a dear friend, the CEO of Charter Schools USA, and someone who is working across almost 90,000 parents today and educators to make sure students are, in fact, receiving the education they deserve. Um, John's no stranger to uh, adversity. Um, from his service in the U.S. Army um, as a Green Beret uh, to his development of Charter Schools USA. He hails from a family of public school teachers. He's married to a public school teacher and a lifelong teacher. His life and career have been dedicated to leadership and actually trying to change things um, that most people wouldn't dare um, jump into. So, John, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Jeannie. Great to be with you. So let me ask you to tell me first um, a little bit about what your life's like here in, uh, in the world of COVID. What are you doing? Um, how are your kids? And um, how are you faring? Well, we're faring okay. It's uh, crazy like everyone. I don't know if anyone saw the Sunday morning little clip that came on CBS where the one of the producers is at home in New York with his five kids and, and he's like, I'm not going crazy. And, and then he shows the kids with wrappers everywhere. Yeah, Jim Gaffigan, home, have, love that guy. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, in our home, we have uh, um, five kids, actually six uh, with the two boys that uh, we've adopted from Haiti. But with those, um, one is um, married and, and, and staying here some with his wife and and then um, all of our kids are online every day. Sherry and I are, are working from, uh, from here. And we all try to find spots in the house that have uh, Wi-Fi still working. So I'm in the back office over here, you can see. And I, I just took it away from one of my kids who was working in here. So here we are. And we're doing OK. And we're just thankful we're healthy. And I hope you are. And hope everyone listening is. Absolutely. 
And, you know, I guess I got to ask you, did you ever in your wildest dreams think that not just that we'd all be in this, because I think everybody out there would say no, um, but that you would have to suddenly turn um, dozens of schools almost overnight into places of digital and remote learning? No, but um, we did think that, you know, this world of blended and online is a world that we need to be really good at. Um, I'd like to think we are pressing in enough to say we knew this was coming, we weren't. But I do believe that with the work that um, our team has been doing over the last several years around blended instruction, around ensuring accountability and, um, and, and, and innovation in itself is a DNA component of our organization. So because of that, I think we were prepared more than most, but I actually think the bigger thing than the innovation and the research and the technology and the things we've been doing for a while that were preparing us, I think more important than that was actually the mindset, um, the culture, the underlying uh, perspective that when you join our team, when you're a part of who we are, we're an organization that's, we live or die based on innovation. We based on, uh, we have to every day, you know, um, attract and keep and retain great employees and students. And parents choose us if they think we're a better option for them or they don't choose us if we're not. So I think because we're in the marketplace of um, producing and creating results that are really, quite frankly, very obvious, um, I think we were better prepared than most because quite frankly, our mindset from the beginning has been based on one of, yeah, you know what? Um, we better be better and different or why are we here? Well, and that's that live or die piece, right? So, so let's make sure everybody knows, like sort of level set, what Charter Schools do, uh, USA does. So first of all, you're in rural, suburban, and urban. Um, your schools are spanning nine states, is that right? Yeah, we're around, we're, I think seven now, but we're in, we're in markets where we could be in the inner city and the hardest hit, 99%, 100% free and reduced lunch, or suburbs, or, or dense areas, or rural areas, and it's given us a cross-section of America to ensure that we can serve all kids, and it's been part of our model to, um, to ensure that we can meet all the demands of all those different types of uh, markets. And you and I have talked a lot about this over time, and I think in particular right now, this sort of point where we're recognizing before we kind of get in the nitty gritty of how you're educating, John, and that's what we're going to do, folks, because that's what we promised you. This issue of access, you know, we've seen it. We've been working a long time in rural communities and states from North Carolina to Colorado to really drive change so that no matter where you are, you don't have to get on a bus and go 90 miles down a road. And oh, by the way, Flash, we can't get on buses today anyway. But even beyond that, there was always that obstacle and barrier. And now we're hearing that there's so many limitations. In fact, we're just hearing it. We've heard this, but so many limitations in terms of bandwidth and access. And so talk to me a little bit about how you bridge that divide. I mean, clearly this is something that we all believe every child should have access to. But, but is it as severe as we're hearing? And can students still learn, even if they're in a rural community today, if we don't right now get them everything we can? I mean, we have to get them everything we can, but right now we also have to teach them, right? Yeah, so I don't wanna be um, overly uh, politically incorrect, but I will be. And that is that this whole notion that kids don't have devices and that there's not access is way overblown. I, I'm just gonna be honest. Um, it's, it's true, there are markets and places we had kids, right? But the ability to get those children uh, devices to ensure that they had enough broadband uh, network access actually has not been the largest barrier for students to learn. Um, I think sometimes it's been an excuse that some people have used in the education space to say why they can't educate all kids because if they can't educate um, mm. all, they're not going to educate any, which I can't imagine is a good idea. But the fact is that we surveyed our parents very early. We identified where there were gaps. There were some, but not nearly the numbers that might have been five or 10 years ago. The truth is, is most people today have access to technology 
and a form or uh, uh, a, a function that is uh, usable with the kind of uh, technology that we're communicating on today, like Zoom. Um, and the truth is, is that that was not our biggest barrier to success. The biggest barrier out there to success is, um, is quite frankly, the preparedness of the education thinkers, the teams, the people to implement something, quite frankly, that they just weren't prepared for or were ignoring for years right. when they should have been prepared for. And that is, to me, the reason that we have been successful, why we literally moved to online um, and remote learning. And we're a bricks and mortar company. We're not a virtual company. Um, we moved to this form of education literally seamlessly from day one during this process. Okay, so what does that look like? Help us, help us gauge that because I, I'm hopeful, John. I'm hopeful that there are innovative leaders in every sector, traditional, public, charter, and private. And then there's non-innovative leaders in all those sectors, right? Um, but I'm hopeful that we yeah. can do this and I wanna see this as we all do, like now, so we don't have to wait. So we don't have to spend summer just you know, doing art projects, art's great. Don't get me wrong, but we're all doing plenty of our projects at our homes, adults and kids. So what does it look like what you're doing right now? So the divide isn't, the, what it looks like is it, it's based less on traditional charter, private, pub, uh, those divides really have, I think, little to do with this transformation. Um, I think that it does though, um, illuminate who had the structural work done early on. Again, I'm not talking just the technological structural work, which I'll walk you through. I'm not talking about just the learning structural work. Um, I'm talking about the, prep the preparedness, things like the professional development for teachers, um, giving teachers the tools and the comfort to be able to transition from primarily a classroom instruction model to one that's uh, virtual. Um, we had teachers that had never taught virtual, many of them, most of them, in fact, you know, we have nearly 10,000 of them. And for them to transition is, you know, and to be doing this um, almost without um, um, notice, you know, this really happened quickly to all of us, um, really is a testament to their mindset. So I want to first shout out that it started with the teachers. It literally started with the teachers. You know, even in the education uh, charter space, all these smart people think that they've got all the solutions. Right. And I have to tell you, Jeannie, I think it's kind of almost refreshing because there's as many bureaucrats in the charter world there are in the traditional or that there are in the private set. I'm sorry, there just are. And bureaucracy is a mindset. And my, my thinking here is that what's been really fun is we just had thousands of teachers basically say, we're going to make this work. We're going to become coaches. We're going to stand up and become facilitators of the technology. Yeah, we were using some of it in the classroom before. We might have been using iReady. We might have been using Edmonton. But now we're doing all of this virtually in a way where we're able to engage. I had an art teacher, for example, who started out, and she literally was like not um, ever had ever instructed through um, online um, uh, virtual remote. And, um, and she was, you know, a little older and from a generation where she wasn't comfortable with that. And at first she was struggling and immediately her, 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 her students reached out and said, Mrs. So-and-so, and I won't give the name, will you help us? Because we still want to do art. We love your classroom. We love what you do. She engaged in Schoology. She engaged in Zoom. She began to use the tools that we gave her, but she had to want to do it. Her students encouraged her, she wanted to do it. We gave her to professional development and together that ended up creating a teacher now who's super excited. And then the television station just came out the other day and literally did an, um, an entire segment on their show about her and her students. That's an example of the mindset first that teachers have to have to switch over. And does that mindset, like, is it sent, and I don't mean centralized mindset, but is every school and every set of educators doing it more flexibly? And sort of what part of their program were they able to develop? Yeah, so the way we did it is, is that um, some of the tools that we provide in each state are a little bit different because each state has different sets of standards. 
Um, and because of that, the, we found certain tools to be more effective in some places than other places. But generally, the same fabric is in place. Um, there's a schedule, there's an opportunity for teachers to be engaged every day with every child and every family. So it's a requirement that every teacher every day engages every day with their, with their students and with the family. It's a requirement that our principals engage with all the teachers every week and provide uh, feedback and support and direction. Um, and that's a requirement. Well, we're also finding that, um, that the ownership side of it is important. So creativity, it can't just be top down, Jeannie, it has to be bottom up. So having teachers help be a part of solutions. Um, bringing in new ideas is a part of our fabric of this model as well. So again, it's not a one size fits all model. You have to do it this way, but we have given them the tools and resources. And I have to tell you, Noble Education Initiative, my wife's organization, you're well aware of the nonprofit, Sherry's team actually has done 10, like, I think 8,500 professional development seminars online for those teachers to provide them with the kind of understanding of how to use those tools. So that's been an incredibly important aspect of this because if they don't know how to use the tools, they won't use them. Okay, so how, so, so let's talk about the, the how. No, they won't be able to use them unless they know how to use them. Professional development obviously is critical. You know, one of the questions um, out there, which kind of goes to this whole concept of seat time, is how do, you, how do you prepare for social distancing? How do you prepare for a world when you're supposed to go back to school, but parents have chosen to attend for being seat-based, not a learning center? In other words, there's a mindset that parents say, I want to send my kids to school. I've actually seen a lot of parents saying they're super excited to be part of their kids' learning. I've also seen other people in the world of social media um, saying, oh gosh, I can't wait till they go back. And what does go back look like, A, if they're not currently able to learn, and B, if parents are going to get nervous. There are going to be people who keep their kids home. I mean, isn't this also part of no, no need to rely on place and space? You know, what is the, yeah. what is the answer for that? The answer is, is that parents, first and foremost, are becoming very clearly more aware of what their students, uh, what their children are learning and what they're not. Um, one of the things I love about this whole process, Jeannie, is that um, we want accountability. The number one accountability, and you and I talk about this all the time, is a parent being engaged in their child's education. And we say it like it's a book cover, but the fact is, is that parents are seeing it every day. I'm seeing it. I'm walking around. I'm watching my own kids online. I have a right, I could literally turn my computer you could, if I could go out the door and show you, they're on there. And I walk by and I ask them, what are you learning? What are you doing? I hear the teachers interfacing. I know when that teacher is engaged with, that, uh, with one of my kids or not, because I'm hearing it. I heard them the other day. So first and foremost, the, 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 the parent has to stay engaged in the new uh, reality, the okay, new Okay, before world. you go to the next point then, hold on, before you go to the next point, let me ask you, yeah. because you're gonna, yeah, everyone out there is thinking this, I know you are, yep. you're saying, yep. okay, John, but that's you. All these parents don't know how to be engaged. You can't expect a low-income parent, you can't expect a parent in the other room that's working to be as engaged. Yes. So let's say they aren't, because I actually did, do think, I've written about this, parents have the capacity to figure this out. We just, by the way, kept them out of that equation. So it's kind of relearning. We're using skills like muscle mass we didn't have before, right? But let's say that's not the case. Can a teacher on a call, on a Zoom, on a whatever, keep a student engaged even if a parent is not like, hey, eyes on the teacher, kid? Absolutely. And so that's what's happening right now is, um, you know, what we're trying to do is give the student an experience that is engaging enough that they want to be involved in it first and foremost. See, this is the missed point. Um, I've actually seen instruction where teachers are sending out information, not within our, our, our system, that is just really busy work. It's just a way to keep the kids busy. They're just slamming them with, with work. They're not really engaging them. They're not coaching them. They're not asking them the questions. You know, the Socratic method is just as capable through this medium, just like you and I are conversing right now, as it is in the classroom. And for some reason, we, 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 we miss this, this interface. It is absolutely reliant on the concept of being that the student is highly engaged, 
and that they're interested in the information and then that they're using it in a way that whether they're whether their parent whether the parent is involved or not right. they're involved and we're seeing engagement levels up and what we're doing Jeannie to know that is we're actually we built a data system to track that so we're actually tracking student engagement we're tracking teacher engagement we're tracking parent engagement we're tracking every piece of the model so that we can absolutely say that this is what we're getting. Because if you want a new model in the future, Jeannie, that we're envisioning, where the classroom comes to the kid, not the kid to the classroom, where classrooms go to students and students don't just go to classrooms, if you want that model to be a blended world like we see in the future, where some kids will come to a regular classroom, some will learn from home, some will go both back and forth. Maybe there's a reflare up of this crisis. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be prepared. We will be prepared. And the reason we'll be prepared is because the learning will take place wherever the child is because the classroom itself is still, is still educating. It's still using the same tools. It's still doing that in a way that they're engaged. And that only happens if you prepare the teachers and you prepare the students and you prepare the parents. We actually have to do professional development for the parents too, which we're doing. So um, a couple of people are asking how you're actually tracking the engagement. Like when you said you built a tool, what is that yes. tool? We all, you know, we, we haven't seen it. Like, what does it look like? You know, you don't have to show us this minute. We can certainly share, you know, technology with folks that they want as a follow-up, but what does that actually look like? I mean, I remember, um, you know, being exposed to a lot of the online higher ed programs a few years ago when I started mentoring some of the new ed tech companies out there, John, I remember shared with you that they actually can see by clicks. You can actually count clicks. You can actually count engagement. Um, so is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so what we're doing is we're actually tracking the different types of interactions between students and teachers in these online learning platforms. So. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for school leaders to attend all virtual sessions and review all virtual contact for the instructional staff themselves, right? You just can't expect a principal to know in this world the same way without understanding the data. So what we're doing is we're creating data, uh, data points that give snapshots into the idea of basically what activity is happening virtually in the classroom, such as student notes to teachers, quizzes, assignments, so that school leaders can actually gauge their interactions relative to the okay. network average. So they can actually look at a specific teacher and say, I see your interaction levels are lower than so-and-so here. Help me understand why. Why are, don't your students need the same level of interaction? Um, it's that interactivity that's much more important than people realize than just a data point of, oh, you finished this class or this lesson. That is, of course, already in there. The more important thing is what's the interaction level, the engagement level, and how do we actually track that? So there's a dashboard, right? Just to yes. get really granular. There's a dashboard yes. and you can look at the dashboard and you can go, um, Mr. Hage has, you know, this many of our students has been, have been on for math. And then you can see actually how long those students have been on and when they've logged on. Yeah, so what we're basically doing is we're tracking um, enrollment and when they go on, uh, the interface is there visibly, teachers talk with the students, then we make sure we track their participation. We track that through usage and mastery. We do that in five of the most big areas like math, ELA, and then we be, we're able to see the quality of the student work as they go through their instructional software programs. So this way, when a program's not being used at a recommended level by the school, we can adjust instruction real time and then focus on those key drivers so that we can ensure that the student is making the most of that online uh, resource. So we're actually able not only to see the instructional time of the student on the resource, i.e. whatever, and I can give you a whole list of those genies, so those who are listening can go to some of those resources, we spent a lot of time over the last several years vetting out which really works and which, and so one of the things that's important is there's a ton of products and services out there, but not everything is built for this environment. Okay, and so on, on, that, on that note, a couple of questions. Um, some of the people in the Q&A have these, but I've had the same ones for you, John. Um, are you, did you build your own or did you buy, right? So you've been trying innovations and what, what's working and what's not, 
And then, and then what do you do with kids who aren't on? Maybe, they're, maybe they need low tech. We had a discussion last week on our series. Some of the people might have seen that with uh, Mark Leeson from Philly, who said a lot of people just want low tech. Howard Fuller on our first event was calling in from Milwaukee. He said, look, our parents just want low tech. They want to be able to open a book. They want to be able to give them kids something. It doesn't mean they're not ready for high tech. They just don't necessarily have, again, we've not conditioned or trained. And as some people have pointed out, even today, you know, this is a time to begin to make that shift, but what can we do so that we, so that we get rid of the vocal minority who say it's not possible when a parent is not totally engaged? Yeah, so I'm going to tell you that it's a combination. Um, we've looked at everything out there virtually, right? We, we, we obviously were based in Florida. We've seen Florida virtual. We've seen a lot of things. You're going to have Julie Young on next, and she's a, a brilliant thinker, and she built one of the best platforms in the country, and she's, going to be, she's doing great work at ASU. But what we have found so far is that what we needed for our students, because we're primarily a bricks and mortar organization, is we needed tools that work in the classroom as well as they work when you're at home. And so what we did early on is we made sure that the criteria for every single product that we bought, an LMS, an SIS, a, a software, a, a, a curriculum instructional guide, whatever it was, that it was capable of providing us with virtual content as much as real content. It doesn't mean that you still can't do you know, paper. So if you go back to an environment where there's still paper, you can feel very comfortable that that paper's in front of those kids and they're still working on it. The difference is, is that paper needs to be also capable to be in a virtual platform so that that document is also there. And that's unfortunately not the case. Most of the document, most of the software out there, Jeannie, most of the curriculum out there, they say, oh, we put it virtually. That's usually a PDF of the same piece of paper. That's mm. not what we're talking about. Okay. We're talking about a way that kids can interface with that information. They can fill it out. They can manipulate it. They can question it. They can do Q&A. They can create uh, feedbacks on that. Right. That's right. the difference. So everything we were doing in bricks and mortar always had the ability to be blended in virtual, number one. Right. Number two is we decided early on that our remote learning plans had to include student access um, both to this print and digital material, but as well for the instructional les lessons and the activities that promote standard-based instruction. So what do I mean by that? It means that we used online platforms. And I'm going to give you a couple names because I think people ought to think about these folks. One of the best ones out there is Edmentum. Jamie Candy, I think she was on your program last week. Jamie's a great leader there. She's got a great product. They're continually innovating. They've been great partners with us. They're the kind of folks who get down in the weeds and think with you, and they can, you know, customize and help. Um, so wait, they customize, the, they, cast, they customize the curriculum. They take your curriculum, they put it into a, into a form that someone can access online, that the teacher can track, right? As I remember her sharing that with us. So that that's right. so you're not the, just taking a new thing. It's not like yet another fad. That's right. It's not another fad. It's not something that'll be gone in a year. They're taking what we're already learning and helping us learn it, you know, teach it and learn it better uh, within a virtual platform. Same with Edmodo, Schoology, Clever, been a great platform. Zoom, obviously, like we're on right now. Microsoft Teams has also been a very strong platform for us. But we've also used adaptive technology. These adaptive technologies include things such as Lexia, iReady. iReady has been a great platform for our students. Achieve 3000 and Ready Plus. And what do they do? They personalize the learning and the supplemental tools using such things as Flipgrid and Edpuzzle. So some of these are the organizations that have been, I think, at the forefront of both classroom and virtual. And They're John, are they, are they like all integrated? I didn't mean to interrupt you, but are they all integrated? Yeah. So it's not like you know, if you looked at my computer on a, on a good day, there's 15 different apps. And the good news is I like to integrate. So most things are integrated, but there are like, it's difficult to navigate. Mm -hmm. Are there, is there one for math and one for reading or are they talking to each other? So they're not all integrated. Um, and um, no one's really done that yet. And I think that's actually some of the work Julie Young is doing at ASU. You'll probably hear that from her. I think what we have found is that we still have to integrate some things because you know they don't all talk to each other. But what we've done is we've become to integrate 
tour ourselves. So we're a large enough system, Jeannie, that we're learning all the time on how to integrate these technologies and how to use them together. And then we'll work with our school partners and our LMS partners on using those. So we've been in a position, we're large enough that we can get some of these partners to do things for us. And then quite frankly, smaller mom and pop charters, other innovators out there, they can follow some of the stuff we're doing. And quite frankly, you know, don't have to spend the time and energy we have, just replicate what we're doing successfully. And we're good with that. We're more than happy to share what we're doing, Jeannie. And your, and your dashboard, did you create that to, to encompass all these things? Yes, we did that. But we also created it from the student teacher perspective first. Most dashboards come from administrator dashboard only, you know, sort of following the rote kind of requirements. What are the outcomes? Right. We also something that teachers can easily use and students. So that's why we're, we're developing our own dashboard around that work. But we're also doing things such as ensuring, and this is really an important point, Jeannie. You know, a lot of people say, well, this online learning virtual world, it's not gonna help all kids. Only these kids are good at technology. That's not true. You can actually have it more customizable for students who are ELL and SPED kids so that they're receiving remote learning and support that's very specified for them and very unique so that occupational therapy, speech therapy, these things that kids that are, have an IEP, we can make sure that their IEP is actually being implemented through a virtual content provider and through our, um, our teaching and our, uh, our uh, educational team, um, actually in some ways more customizable than they could even in a classroom instruction world. Okay, so I got down the rabbit hole of inputs and programs and projects because there's lots of interest in that. I've had interest in that. I know people are out there going to how, but let's go to the, the what, right? So what's the result? What are you seeing in terms of overall attendance? What are you seeing in terms of parents calling, teachers calling? I know we can't say that there's an ultimate outcome, academic outcome at this point, although I do, I am interested in unlike Philadelphia and uh, San Francisco and LA, are you going to let learning count? Um, uh, I know that was really snarky, but I am kind of ticked and I think everybody should be that there's people out there saying sh things shouldn't count. Even if we think about counting it differently, how many people wake up in the morning and they're like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. You just do the work anyway. It's not going to count. Anyway, right. lest I digress, what are you doing to understand and to see what the result is? So we're starting to see really good results. Um, and how do we know? Because we're actually tracking the data. We're actually following what student interaction looks like, the engagement levels, not just completion of assignments. We're seeing that uh, mastery of content is becoming more important than sort of these clunky tests. So in Florida, we have the FSA. The FSA is this three quarters of the year, you take the test and it's supposed to tell you what you knew or you didn't know. You can pass on to third or fourth grade. You know, these things are, um, I think, gonna be seen as relics of the past at some point. We're gonna go to content mastery, Janie. We're gonna go to a place where, um, that we're constantly looking at what is the student engagement level? What is the student mastery level? What is the amount of knowledge that they know that they can also um, discuss and, and, and determine that it's useful? Um, this is allowing us to actually customize that. I think the biggest barrier though, quite frankly, I know you're gonna ask the question anyway, so I'm sort of moving towards it, is that all of the systems currently, even for charter schools, are not set up for that. They're set up for seat time. They're set up for you know, big tests at the end of the year that you either know or you don't, you pass or you go. And this constant learning environment of evaluating content mastery, of learning um, um, in an environment where um, it's on your pace, where students can pace themselves at faster or slower levels depending on their capacity and their knowledge, um, that is not the way the classroom is set up today. The classroom is set up so that all kids stay at the same content at the same time at the same level within mm -hmm. the same classroom and they pass to the same grade right. and uh, they take the test at the same time. That, that has to move and the changes are gonna have to happen at a policy level for that to happen. Okay, so are your parents and um, uh, like calling you? Are the kids who are so totally unrelated questions, are the parents calling you 
Um, are the teachers calling and going help? Um, are they saying, no, I don't want to do it? Or are they excited? Um, what happens when the child does not have, like if maybe the mastery is happening on a piece of paper, right? Maybe they're writing it down. Or do you have people watching to see, you know, did Johnny's class get their reading fundamentals in third grade? Yeah. We're finding, and I, and I know Jeannie, I, I don't, I don't want to sound like we're bragging, but I have to brag on our teachers. I just, honestly, I've never felt more proud of them. I really like more proud of them. Um, I have not had almost any negative feedback. I mean, we've had small gaps here or there, right? There's a, that's, that's the reality of any world we live in. But the amount of positive feedback from teachers, students, parents, and leaders, community leaders are starting to see this. We're seeing this across the board. Um, our Twitter is just is lit up with story after story. Every day I go on and I go 50, 60, 70, 80 different posts that I'm watching of, of school after school after school being excited about what they're doing with those students. And they're creating, while we're doing it, new experiences. They're doing... Um, homeroom lessoning. They're doing social emotional learning. We have a partner with Attitude is Altitude, Nick Wojcik, who we're teaching kids how in these times not to be depressed. I mean, these are issues, not just the learning of reading and writing arithmetic, but they're going through tough struggles socially. And so we're interfacing with them on how do they deal with with, with quarantine? What does it look like? How does they how can they be a positive factor for their for their parents and and you know pick up the dishes tonight or ask how your mom's doing in the morning and and and, and making them aware that the world around them is struggling for a crisis not um, just to focus on their curriculum lessons so those things are helping us have a real interface with face with students that I think makes it more than oh you have to go to school today to learn this that is not the experience we're doing we're giving them the experience of school coming to them. And because of the way that the mindset was set from the beginning, the tools were decided on, the way that we're interfacing with the kids, we're seeing enormous success. I, and I really mean that, enormous success across all of our schools, all of our teachers, everyone stepping up to the table and delivering with lots of great professional development and support from all of our teams. I mean, it's not a CSUSA thing alone. It's a lot of folks around us. But together, we're producing something that I couldn't be more proud of. That's really amazing to share. And I think there's a lot of people who are still wondering, um, like, that's now. What does the future look like as we move? And as we start closing this down, we can have a million of these conversations, and we need to. We need to be having them not just with you and I. We need to be having them everyone in their communities we need to be having them with policymakers. Um, as we posited today, um, why do we have boundaries right now, right? If there's a school, there's a woman that we work with whose student is in Fairfax County, Virginia. They couldn't even a wealthy system get this movie with Blackboard. And she just enrolled her daughter in a school in Hawaii, but she had to pay for it. And that's okay if you can pay for it, but that shouldn't be the barrier, right? Um, so what is the inter what does the internet look like for us now as we sort of start to close, John? What is the, um, does everyone have a device? Should everyone, so do your kids all have devices and access? Should everyone in America just be given that? Should that, should that come with their backpack, frankly? Should that be the student? Yes, I, I actually think that, that I don't want to understate the, uh, the gap in technology. There's definitely still gaps out there. It's less around the device, I think. There are still some people without devices, but 95, we're seeing very, very high numbers of device uh, um, ownership. And where they don't, we can provide that. But then there's, there's the gap in broadband. Obviously, um, having the ability to have access in a broadband environment that has a higher capacity is very important, not just outside of school, but within schools. I think that's an investment infrastructure that even as a person who's not real big on the government doing everything for us, I believe that's an area where we will get a 10x return if we have the best broadband yeah. and best infrastructure in the world. Third, I would say that you know this whole idea that teachers um, are sort of unwilling 
to move into an environment. We've heard this debate for years, Jeannie, you and I know it. Um, um, we've seen teachers union out there push back because the teachers aren't, uh, they're, they're not prepared. I just think that's hogwash. I think teachers, absolutely, that's understating and underestimating what teachers are capable of. I mean, we, we just, we put teachers in a box. We make them sound like they're different somehow. Like, in fact, they're more technology sensitive and um, creative than most of us. Why? Because they've been doing it in classrooms. And if they haven't, they're now doing it in ways where they're learning. And yeah, it was forced on all of us. But the fact is, is that they took it with mindset that we can do this and kids matter and students are first. And it's not really about adults first. It's about students first. And if you really care about kids, if you really want students to learn, you don't let barriers get in the way of that. You create environments and you teach them that, hey, we're not gonna let, and quite frankly, that's the lesson of all this. What I love about the, the, the silver lining of what is otherwise a tragic thing we're going through is that it's actually teaching us to be more resilient, to crash down barriers, to not let technology barriers or software barriers or, or, or teacher um, student barriers or even quite frankly seat time barriers or even testing barriers. All of those are barriers in some ways, Jeannie, to what we need to get to. If we can get it back, we actually have some ways getting back some interface between parent, student, teacher that I'm incredibly happy about because it's helping us see that people will take something if they're engaged and they continue to be engaging and if you do that, you will see results that are off the chart. And we're seeing that right now across the board. Well, we're going to be continuing to watch. Uh, we're grateful for your offer to share. Uh, John, um, stay with us for a couple of minutes. We're going to bring on Julie Young and um, just do a little bit of a conversation with the two of you before we go to her solo. So um, creative director, if you could bring on uh, Julie. But John, let me ask you as we're bringing on Julie. Um, what do you say to um, folks out there who go, what about the kids who are home by themselves? What about the kids who don't have access? I mean, to me, frankly, that's a bigger issue than just education, right? That's social distancing. It's kid people have to go to work. But are there, are there stopgap measures that we could, we could handle? Yeah, I think, you know, we just threw out two and a half trillion dollars of money, and I'm not sure how much of that money is actually going to go to places like ensuring every child has a high quality uh, smart device in their hands or a computer or that broadband. But if, you know, I was in charge, that's where I'd be spending this money over the long term is I'd be making sure that, because it's not just for education, it's for, it's for the parent who has to work from home. It's for, um, the interface for professional development, online learning for adult learning. There's a lot of adults right now who want to be learning something, but they might not have the access, or they only have enough dial-up Wi-Fi for one person, their kid to either be on online or for them, and they both can't be. There's a lot of realities around that kind of stuff, um, Jeannie, that we can break down as a society, and we need to be focused on that. The, the, the private sector can do the innovation side. Let us do that. The government should be involved in the infrastructure. Let them build the roads. And quite frankly, broadband is a road. It's as much of a road as what we drive on in a car. So why wouldn't we be driving that within government? But um, when it comes to um, the private sector, that's our job is to innovate. And that's where we're doing really good work right now. And I know Julie does amazing work. I can't wait to hear her. Welcome, Julie yes, Young, CEO of ASU Prep Digital. So pleased to have you with us. For those of you who don't know Julie, she has been an extraordinary uh, education innovator extraordinaire for nearly three decades. Uh, she helped found Florida Virtual School, which was the nation's first statewide virtual school. And Julie, how does it make you feel like Alaska is buying Florida Virtual? Talk about no borders, no boundaries. And she now leads uh, one of the most innovative institutions, ASU Prep Digital, at one of, if not the most innovative university in the country, Arizona State University. So welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So before you and I chit chat alone, I wanted to give you a chance to maybe um, ask John a question or maybe answer something that you thought he did just a lousy job answering. <laughs> oh, nice so, to be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I laugh. Um, 
I, he didn't do a lousy job answering anything. He did a phenomenal job. And I was sitting here just like going, yes, yes, that too, that too. Um, John and I are what, uh, way back when were what I called and coined coopetition. We were cooperating competitors in Florida at a time when we were forging new territory and trying to um, kind of put a stake in the ground on the value of online learning and, and so forth. And I think uh, one of the things I actually want to just kind of like really chime in on is the comments you made, John, about making sure your systems will work both in your brick and mortar schools as well as in your online school, you know, your online quote unquote version um, seamlessly and how important that is and what this current situation is going to teach us about how we build our programs. I think that was a, a really critical point. Great. Yeah, I, found, I found Julie, it's um, honestly, when we look back, we never predicted like uh, Jeannie was asking that this would happen. But thank God we built that into the criteria from the beginning. So it was so seamless. That's good. Thank you. I also love the comment, Julie, about yeah, co-opet co-opetition. Co wait, wait, co 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 <laughs> co co-op edit co editors is what I was looking for. Um, the adverb, because in the world of education innovation, it's actually okay to be competing. It's not a bad word. And I suspect that um, you were watching him and learning what he was doing while he was watching you and trying to figure out how to clean your clock. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think that we all know that competition or co competition makes you better. And without it, you have the luxury to coast. And so I do think that the competition in the education space, although it has not been welcomed, it has been an important um, component to moving the needle forward over the years. It's very true. Well, John, with that, thank you for being with us. Um, hopefully you'll be watching this conversation uh, and we'll be you're continuing. Getting on, you're getting onto the better part of the program anyways, uh, smarter, prettier, the whole thing. So guys, have fun. Thank you, Jeannie. And uh, appreciate you guys and Julie, you're a superstar. Thank you guys, oh, keep it thank up. You. Thanks bye -bye. so much, John. So are you. Have you. So Julie, tell us how, as we start, what, uh, what the world's been like for you all um, with COVID hitting. I mean, obviously ASU Digital Prep has been in the digital business, um, but um, first of all, start telling us personally, you are in, still in Florida? I am in Florida. And for those that don't know, I, I still live in Florida. I commute to Arizona, usually out there a couple of weeks out of the month. So I'm grounded, and so that's been awkward and odd, but actually, you know, given us the time as a family to take a breath, and we've, I think, like many people, tried to look at the silver lining and seize the time to be, you know, together as a family, and I've cooked more than I think I've cooked in 15 years, um, and I love to cook, but, you know, it's not fun when you don't have time, and so, um, yeah, so it's, it's been an, in an awkward way, as challenging as it has been for our world and our country and our students, I think there will be um, also many good stories that come out of it. And what did you do most differently to start? And so let's kind of level set everybody about ASU Digital Prep and what was the difference with your distribution, your delivery of education pre-COVID and now? So for ASU Prep Digital, not a lot of difference because we actually have our own full-time program um, with about 700 students that are completely virtual. And then we serve into our schools in the state of Arizona and around the country as well, um, where we provide instruction or licensing or training, et cetera. So we've Basically, I think the difference has been that all of those things that we are, we are doing with our schools, as opposed to our full-time school, have all been enhanced in different ways. And so as we look at um, you know, the services that we provide and we provide what's needed, we, we, we really don't have a cookie cutter menu of here are our services, would you like to buy them? 
Um, we really go into our schools with, with two questions, and those are what problems would you like to solve or what opportunities would you like to create? And then we build a program and an instructional model or a methodology specifically for those schools and for those particular needs. So utilizing those two same uh, you know, schools of thought as we've worked with our schools um, out in the field, um, we have about 68 partners that are in Arizona, but we also have our own um, network. ASU Prep Academy is a, a network of charter schools that uh, President Crow and ASU authorized about 10 years ago, starting with a turnaround school in downtown Phoenix. And now we have 12 schools, 11 of which are brick and mortar schools um, on seven different campuses. And so what has been amazing is based on the work that we've been doing the last two years, I've been there three years, but over the last two years, we have been working very diligently on moving all of our schools into the blended personalized learning uh, mastery based education world. And so all of that work that we've been doing over the last two years was very helpful in uh, allowing us to transition our schools to fully online, literally within 48 hours. That's pretty amazing. And this gets to the heart of, again, this continuing question. It's certainly a question we get on a regular basis from media lately. It's a question from the people who are participating in this forum today, all over the place, Julie. So how do you transition? Like, what does that look like? Not just now, right? Not just now where hopefully in the most cases, students are home with an adult who can guide them. And on the other end of the computer is a teacher, presumably, and some tools that they can access, which everyone really is hungry for details about. But how do you shift to that mastery when we're a world that's dependent on seat time? So I think it's a, it's a great question, Jeannie. And I think that uh, first and foremost, leadership matters. Um, we sit within ASU, as you indicated, the, the largest university and the most innovative university in the country and very heavily um, committed to distance education and online learning. So um, if you look at the institution as a whole, 75,000 what we call immersion students who come to campus at the university level and another 45,000 plus that learn online pre-COVID. And so when all of this started, uh, President Crow, our leader, actually started um, an early effort of an early effort of getting, getting everyone ready, including our K-12 schools. So we really started working on putting together a learning continuity plan, uh, mm -hmm. you know, six weeks before we had to make the transition, we started working on that. Um, and then, and, and then, of course, you know, we had the, the comfort of kids going on spring break and being able to really ready our teachers, our families, and our students mentally and emotionally for the fact that they may not be coming back to school. Right. So we truly made the decision on like Friday or Saturday before we um, let everyone know they would not be coming back on Monday. The students would not be coming back on Monday. And, um, and things changed by the hour. And I think that, you know what, it's my belief that you always plan for the, you know, you, you, you plan, you hope for the best and you plan for the worst. And you always have your plan A, your plan B, your plan C. What if this happened? What, what if that happens? And so we did do that. And so the leadership at our um, digital team and our brick and mortar schools, our immersion sites work very, very closely together for over a month. Mm together the training plan, the transition plan, um, identify how many devices that we had, identify where there were bandwidth issues, um, uh, proceeded to look for, um, we were able to get an order in early for hotspots. Um, so we ordered a, a bulk of hotspots so that we would have those ready to distribute. That's great. Uh, so we, we had a lot of plans in place that allowed us to just kind of go into go mode and um, the families were grateful. They are grateful um, and very, very cooperative. And, and we also had, you know, with our training plan, for example, the first day after spring break, we invited all of the teachers 
to come into their schools for training with some distancing or allowed them to stay home and do what we're doing now. And about half, it was about half and half. Um, and then we did, you know, two full days of heads down training with our digital team, um, coaching our immersion team. And then we've provided optional training almost every day since the day that we transitioned so teachers could avail themselves to whatever it is that is surfacing as their need um, for, for teacher training and parent training. And I know you're doing a lot of, um, you've got a dashboard you've had, and I want to learn more about that. But I wonder if um, our, our tech people could cue the video. We've got a short video, very quick just to show a little bit, because some of this stuff is high tech, some low tech, but I'd love to everyone to see um, this video. Let's, let's roll this. So you'll have to tell us if this is accurate, Xander, <laughs> since you know all there is, no. All right, the taxi fare in Gotham City is $2.40 for the first half mile, and additional mileage is charged at the rate 20 cents for each additional 0.1 mile. So that's not each additional mile, that's each 0.1 mile or one tenth of a mile. You're planning on giving the, ten, the driver a $2 tip. How many miles can you ride for $10? Now, I would love to see some discussion in the chat box on this question. You're welcome to write on the screen. If you're a tables person, you wanna make a table and write it out or if you're an equations person and want to share how you do it with equations, please do so because there are a lot of different options for solving a problem like this. Really interesting. So tell us what we were just seeing. Is it typical? Um, has that been happening already? Is that new? So that's what we call a live lesson. And uh, so our teachers actually have live lessons with their students. Uh, depending on the subject area, it could be once a week. Uh, in, in our uh, current situation with our brick and mortar schools going fully online, it's likely once or twice a day, depending on the subject. Could be whole group, could be small group, could be one-on-one. -on -one. But it's a very interactive way in which to synchronously engage your students. You heard her say, let's see something in the discussion group. Let's see, you're welcome to write on the whiteboard. Um, you can make a table. It's a way for you to really engage your, your students so they, number one, see you, um, uh, see your smile, hear your voice, hear the tone in your voice. And they're also uh, there with their peers. And so it helps with um, students feeling connected and part of their school community and eliminates that feeling of isolation. Um, so the kids love it. They, they actually feel like they're coming together. They're with their, with their peers and they're actually having real discussion and real dialogue. How, does your, how do your teachers know when someone needs additional support or, in, or in, you know, in, intervention? So there's, there's several different ways that we have you know, discovered over the many years. Um, number one, you've got data analytics with every uh, program that we're using and within Canvas, the LMS, that gives you a footprint of what the students have been doing or not doing. And so you can see very readily how much time they spend on a particular module, a particular, particular lesson, et cetera. So the data, teaching teachers how to really take advantage of reading the data in whatever applications they are using is really critical. Um, then you also use just good teacher skills in a live lesson. You see who is participating in the chat room, who is writing on, uh, writing on the whiteboard, um, and who is hiding in the shadows. That's always still a very important teacher skill. Um, in addition to that, we do what are called discussion-based assessments. And a discussion-based assessment is, is used for a variety of different reasons, but the two main reasons are number one, to identify exactly what you indicated. Um, it's between the, the, the student, the learner, and the teacher. And the teachers that do it really well customize those discussion-based assessments um, based on what they see in that student's data. They're looking at that uh, student's um, assignments, what they've turned in, what they've indicated, and then they're customizing 
questions to have a discussion around either on the phone or via Zoom with that individual student. It's also what we consider to be the only almost silver bullet um, with academic integrity because no matter what systems that you use right now, um, they are not foolproof in terms of academic integrity. The, the very best strategy is having a conversation face-to-face -face like we are right now mm -hmm. over Zoom with a student. Yeah, and again, that's I think why there's so many people out there that have legitimate questions about this notion of dashboards. I mean, you and I are lucky. You've created them, you use them. I've seen them because, you know, some of us have these weird jobs. This is all we do for a living. So I can, I've seen dashboards where, you know, someone can look at how much time people were on. And I think there's the question of whether it's just so new that I think it's, um, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But this is that time, it seems like, Julie, that we need to get this right. Mm -hmm. um, that we need to figure out how the, we have the right connection between the accountability and the student and the teacher. Um, and so all that goes to a quite another question for you, which is the people out there who are voluntarily enrolling in an ASU digital prep course or school or program, like what, how would you describe them? Where are they? And do, barrier, do boundaries matter in this day and age? Is it too controversial to suggest that maybe you could be educating someone anywhere in the world right now? So, you know, I mean, this is my 25th year, I believe, in digital education, 40th as an educator, and I have been fighting boundaries for the last 25 years of my life. Um, we believe school is a verb. It is, it is, it can be a noun, but it is a verb, and school can take place anywhere at any time. Um, if we, I think one of the things that's most interesting about COVID-19 is the fact that when you listen to the doctors and the experts talk, they talk about the boundaries and that the virus does not know a state border. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time with education, we border and we, we, we you know, just capsulize education based on geographic boundaries. And so I'm hoping this will be one of the positive outcomes that comes from this um, crisis that we are in is that we will look at the boundaries of education and the geographic um, barriers very, very differently. If you think about our students, um, ASU Prep Digital is uh, one of a kind in that it sits within ASU, it sits within the institution, not beside it, um, it doesn't borrow its name. ASU Prep Digital and ASU Prep Academy are part of ASU. And so students that come to us come, come for all the reasons that many students go into virtual programs that we've known for many years, athletes and actresses and Asperger's and ADD and homeschooling, all of those. But then we also have um, a whole host of students that come to us because they wanna be part of ASU. And we have um, a program called College Pathways where when students come to us, we can actually, uh, we design a program specific to their interest. If they're interested in electrical engineering, they can go to our website and they can find their pathway for ninth through 12th year that will actually put them into concurrent courses with the university where they will be into a major by their junior year of high school wow. and have the opportunity to kind of like try that on for size before graduating from high school. And so we have, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds that are um, taking, you know, 12, 16 credits a year. And um, oh, starting. there's no age and there's no grade level barrier. And that really fits with President Crow's mission to create this continuity of learning really from, you know, birth through life. And, and you're able to do that, again, as, um, as an organization that supports charters, as more flexible institutions, but you work with Florida Virtual and most of the customers there were traditional school districts. And so we're dealing with some 
less than 15,000, but still a lot of school districts, most too big, most impervious to change, most challenged as we've seen and written about just today in our future of school effort. Um, not knowing kind of what to do and where to go, do you think they can make the shift or do they all have to become more like charters to get through this next uh, chapter of our lives? You know, it's really interesting, Jeannie, that you asked that question because I think when Florida Virtual School was first created, if you go back in the archives, one of the reasons was to uh, demonstrate that a public school could behave differently could operate differently and you know, potentially produce different outcomes for different reasons. And so we weren't a charter school. Um, we were a unique school and a legislatively created school that was given the flexibility to really redesign education. Um, and you know, so, so I think that you know, so many of the, the the constraints that we put around our public schools in terms of the bureaucracy that we live in uh, have a lot to do with the fact that, you know, we see things so black and white and in, and in certain lanes within our public institutions. I think the other thing um, about your question, um, right now, you know, I think that with what happened, we weren't prepared as a country. We were not prepared as a nation. We were not, you know, our school districts, our states, we weren't prepared. And so in the spirit of never waste a crisis, I hope that we are all really looking at this very differently now. In fact, you know, based on the fact that they're predicting there could be another outbreak, that if we go back to school, we may come out of school again. Um, I don't think school will ever look the same again. I think that parents and um, uh, the citizens of the districts and the states are going to drive change based on the choices that they make for their children. Um, you made a comment earlier um, in, when we were speaking with John about the fact that, you know, there's going to be parents that don't want their kids to go back into school buildings and they're going to want another option. And so what the district, what the school is faced with, can I provide this other option or Am I going to lose that student to another school? Right. Because there are choices out there. Right. And so we're going to work really hard to empower the schools that we work with to create these other options for their students and families themselves and support that so that um, uh, when, a, when a parent says, which we've already had parents in our, um, in our charter school network, indicate that they kind of like this. It was kind of like what you said, and they like the they, they'd like to see a hybrid version um, where there weren't, you know, all of the kids in all of the classrooms all of the time together. And what might that look like for them as a parent in our- I like that look differently. And I bet this has also challenged you in a way as you think about the fact that you were in the position, just like our friends at, you know, for example, I know he's with us today, North Carolina Virtual, and there's other, there are other schools out there. I bet this challenged you to also say, do we have the best math program? Are we, you know, somebody's asking about benchmarking. I'd love for you to address this and folks keep the Q&A going because I am scanning it. But, you know, are we doing this all that we could do? It kind of probably put you in a little bit of a, I should step up and make sure digital prep is doing everything that they possibly can and more. Well, absolutely. And, and again, um, ASU has been leading in this effort and uh, really driving home the, the, the fact that learning should continue and that we, we don't need to have a gap in our learning because we have um, a virus in our country. And so how do we as the educators, how do we as the leaders, um, you know, push forward in, in that effort. So ASU has created what they call, uh, what we call ASU for You, which is a website that is just a growing um, aggregate of resources that are, are being developed and offered for all ages, all grades and ages, um, for schools to avail themselves to and to come to for information and, and what about what you guys are currently providing outside of your existing partner schools and the coursework you do? 
are you making your work available to people um, as new partners, as coaching? Is it free? Like, how does someone decide, like, I, I have to get my school into this position. I can't afford to send them somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a good question. And yes, we are. We are making ourselves available to states, to districts around the country, if not around the globe. Um, we've had certainly an increase in, in interest from other countries as, as we've been experiencing this as a world and not a state or a country. Right. And uh, so we're providing consulting based on uh, how to make the transition. What does that look like? How do you prepare for it? Do you have a, a learning continuity plan? If not, we can support um, with a template or with ideas and expertise about what has worked for us and for our transition with our schools. Um, we're also providing a lot of teacher training and uh, it's all training that we did with our own schools as we made the transition. So uh, we've been able to take that training and hone it and customize it for individuals in different states and in different circumstances and situations. Um, we also have parent training and we also have student training. And you know, one of the things that sometimes gets lost in this mix is that we talk about the teacher training, we worry about the parents knowing how they can uh, support, and we don't talk a lot about the students being ready because we make this assumption that you know, all our students are digital natives and they all know how to do it all when it comes to a computer. There's a lot of truth to that, but there's a whole host of students that um, haven't been exposed to learning in this manner. They might have been exposed to playing in this manner. Um, and so we spend some time on that too. How do you get your students ready to learn in this environment? It reminds me of one of the videos I saw the other day, and I can't remember where it was, but there was a student with a headset and people were running around behind him and the teacher's going, can you hear me? And he's going, I don't know if I can hear you. And I'm thinking to myself, they also have zero um, sense of uh, presence. And so I can just imagine a teacher looking out at a bunch of these kids, which are like this and playing with their hair and doing all these different things. Um, and I got, I, I was a little amused by that, but the point is really well taken that we don't think about our, you know, our students ready. And, you know, to your point, Julie, um, I just find a really interesting common denominator in what you just said about teachers and training and all the training. John Hage said it last week, Stephanie, Stephanie Soroki from Seton said it, um, Greg McGuff from Columbia School District in Pennsylvania said it. Everyone we're talking to that are successful in making the transition, yes, not necessarily out of the park successful in everything, kids are doing it perfectly, we're in a crisis here. But it seems to me that the difference between success and failure is convening teachers regularly, giving them expectations. Whereas conversely, the teachers we've talked to, um, both anecdotally and more formally, that aren't getting anything are the ones who are saying, this is so hard, I can't do it. And so is that consistent with what you know is good practice? Is that the case regardless of a crisis? And, and what can people out there take away from that? Um, and how can you measure it? Like we wanna make sure that the teachers are trained, but are you able to tell us whether we're still putting the best teachers in front of our kids? Yeah, so it is very consistent. And if you think over the years that we've been in this, in this business we call education, anytime there's a budget cut, the first thing that gets cut is teacher development. And so we've, we've fought that for years. I think one of the things that we've certainly seen in this particular situation is those programs that are working, they are training their teachers, they are supporting their teacher, they are providing, um, uh, you know, just different supports all along the way. Uh, we did the two full, you know, the really strong days of, of training um, with our teachers before they launched with their students. But then what we've also done is we've created what we call Zoom rooms. And so they're just rooms that, that, that at any time uh, teachers can come in and we have mentor teachers in those rooms to answer questions from the digital team. So what do I do when no one's behaving on my Zoom? Yeah, um, big question. You know, what, um, how, do I, how do I know if the student's doing the work? You know, those, all those kinds of things. 
Um, then we created Zoom rooms for parents, so parents could come in and get support um, from each other as well as from us. And then we created Zoom rooms for IT so that any, any moment that a student um, or a family has some kind of a hiccup there, rather than having to put in a help ticket and, and wait, we do make them put in a help ticket, but they can get an immediate answer so that they can continue learning and so forth. But training is absolutely the key. And, you know, even in, in, in our environment, you know, some of the things that we did, um, we started uh, last year with early adopters. And then this year, um, our head of schools, Anna Battle, you know, required all of our um, uh, immersion teachers to have a Canvas account. And there are certain things that the teachers all do in that Canvas account. And then there are many who started using it for learning, for a learning tool. Many didn't, but many did start using it as a learning tool. Mm -hmm. That sounds really basic, but that's a big deal when you need to flip a switch. So, you know, everybody had an account, everybody had been trained, some were proficient, some were novice, but they had enough information and knowledge to be, um, you know, adaptable. So, really yeah. That's really interesting because again, I think the, I think the, the, the biggest theme I'm seeing out there, you know, one of the bigger themes that I'm seeing both here in the Q&A and, and, and externally is this notion that, you know, what do we do if a student doesn't engage? And so to know that there are people thinking about this and looking at it, and some of it can be fairly low tech, right, Julie? I mean, my husband, who's an educator, um, basically had to tell all the parents in his class last week that um, their kids are going to get an F if they didn't show up. And guess what? They started showing up. And that's a different example. And it's a different kind of school. And um, but, you know, you didn't show up. You're going to get there's going to be some, you know, result. Right. Some consequence. Does that help? I'm not saying it has to be punitive, folks. Everyone's out there probably like, oh, of course, she would recommend everyone get enough. Not the issue. The issue is, is there a consequence? And does that parent, going back to the training, we can't just turn on, right? Remote education expected to go well. Again, a common theme and thread and denominator in you and all the other folks we're talking to that that are on the right path is that they're thinking about parents. They're thinking about whether the student needs something, but at the same time, I don't get the sense you're letting off the gas on expectations and requirements because you've actually seen that virtual can work. Yeah, we, we, are, we are not letting off the gas um, in any way, shape and form in our schools and who we support. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is, uh, somebody asked me a question the other day about engagement and misbehavior and do kids misbehave online? It's like, yeah. Um, but, you know, it, the engagement factor that you mentioned, teachers get incredibly creative and, and you think about what do I need to do to make sure that they show up for this, you know, 10 a.m. check-in. And um, so, you know, one of the first things they may do is the, the kids can come on, on online into the Zoom and they can do something fun with the tool, turn themselves colors, um, write on the whiteboards, um, play Pictionary, uh, do a trivia game and, and have a prize. We've got a lot of that coming on, sing a song uh, together. Um, learn a new tool. I mean, all kinds of things like that. Um, we have a guitar teacher who, you know, do a, you know, do a song first thing. And so I think the teachers are getting really creative in terms of how do I get them to show up and then keeping them engaged, I think really has to do with the, the personal relationship that you build with these students in an online environment you do so much individually with the families in an online environment that um, you create a different kind of relationship. And so you do get to know these students and these families as individuals. You're, you're, you're on a Zoom and you're in their home and they're in your home. And so, I mean, certainly this is a, a circumstance unlike any other that I've experienced over the years with virtual education. And, and one of the things that we have to do as educators is we have to remember that the parent or parents are home trying to work as well. Right. And so what we did see is, you know, many schools would start out and go, okay, we're gonna keep the same schedule as we have at school. And so we want 
you know, all kids to show up on Zoom at 8, 8, you know, at eight in the morning. And for high schoolers, we're gonna have them check in once every hour at the top of the hour. And, you know, that lasts about a minute. <laughs> and the, the parents can't, the, the parents can't and should not um, have to manage that kind of a schedule under the circumstances. And so once we knew kids were showing up and that they knew how to do the work, then, you know, that was backed off of pretty quickly. And giving parents and students agency and how they plan their schedule. Also, with, with the realization that you do have to have some structure. And so a check-in a day or a check-in every other day um, or an end of the end of the day come together that all the families can plan for. All of those kind of little little tidbits and, and hints have, have been really helpful. Yeah, I read somebody uh, put a note on Facebook the other day on my personal Facebook, a friend saying, well, I got everything done in three and a half hours today so I let the kids go play. Again, not everybody has that ability or luxury right now. Some do because they don't have a job, sadly. But I'm wondering if it's not too radical as we start closing down, Julie, to challenge our, 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 our friends out there, our clients, our colleagues, um, to think about whether or not this helps us move to an environment where maybe school is not sitting in a room for eight hours because we are funding parents to be home, right? So if we're funding students and parents want students to have a different experience than eight or 10 hours, including pre-care, you know, pre-care pre, you know, pre, pre and aftercare, then maybe we should be funding students and families to avail themselves of that. A woman I interviewed for my podcast not too long ago, Erica Comazar, uh, made the art very big progressive, certainly no conservative, made the argument that she thought, you know, mothers should be, because of attachment theory, given the ability to be home longer, she got reamed by lots of people suggesting that was anti-feminist. Um, her point was actually, I want women to work. I want them to be entrepreneurs though. And I want them to be able to have the kind of access, the kind of tools at their disposal um, that people with means have. And so I think it calls on us to think not just about school differently, but what does this mean for the family as we figure this out? Not because it's only the right thing to do right now, but because students learning in rows of 21 or 25 or even 17 in most districts, by the way, out there, aren't learning, right? We're still, we're still less than 30% proficient in anything. So it's not like going back to normal right. makes us any better. Right, I liked what you said in your, um, the paper you released, uh, to, do we really wanna go back to normal? And I think we're taking the posture that this is a new normal we don't even know what this new normal is going to look like yet. And that whether we are going back into buildings in August or not, that our schools will look differently. And if they don't, shame on us. And as we think about uh, parents, parents uh, all over the world, but in the United States have either had the good fortune of, ha of having a good experience right now because their school um, and their school leaders dug in and said, you know, we're gonna do the best we can. We're gonna use the tools that are available to us. We're going to equip the students the best we can and we're gonna continue the process of learning. Um, and then there are those that are not having that experience where learning has shut down or it's, it's become kind of a do what you can. Uh, and I know there's parents that I've talked to that are elated and there are others that are panic stricken and very frustrated. And so, you know, we'll be spending a lot of time over the next five years talking about that dichotomy um, as we move forward. But, um, you know, I, I personally think that because of this, this circumstance, there are going to be a lot of parents who, you know, kind of go, I, I kind of like being this involved in my child's education. I kind of like to work two or three days a week and, spend the other two or three days with my uh, child at home, homeschooling. And, and those are not new models. Those are taking place all over the country in small pockets. Um, 
Christian schools that are offering that kind of a hybrid, exper hybrid experience um, to, the, to um, their constituents, uh, charter schools that are doing the same, some great public schools that have the flexibility uh, with seat time to do some of that. We did some of that in Florida in different pockets, mm -hmm. um, creative leaders. Uh, so I, I do think though that our, our parents are going to drive uh, where we go next. Yeah, it's really interesting. Some of the first charter schools that ever started in California, of course, one of the earliest, um, the earliest pioneers in that, uh, it was mostly Silicon Valley parents who just wanted a different experience for their kids and, and didn't like per, per se, uh, the level of education of kind. It was very experiential, it was very project-based. That hasn't gone away. People love Montessori, think about what that is. Um, Julie, you've given us just a ton uh, to think about and react to and participate in, and I'm grateful that ASU Digital Prep um, has ASU for you, the Arizona State University is making you and your team available um, to people and everybody can access uh, you and our other guests through CER's uh, website, edreform.com. Um, I can't thank you enough and your team for supporting this effort. I want to thank everyone who joined us and my team. Um, I am just so grateful because as you know, we woke up the day after, if you will, if it was one particular day and said, wow, we're in this for a while. Lots of great institutions and organizations who we know are doing great things, but we thought, well, if we could just bring the people we've gotten to know over a couple of decades to everyone else, that's probably the best that we can do. And so you've made um, our job incredibly easy. So I thank you for joining us, Julie. I hope we'll continue the discussion um, and to all of you out there, let's change um, not just the future of school, maybe it's a change in the future of work, um, the future of family, uh, and certainly the way we do business in the U.S. So thanks so much again for joining us. All right. Bye, everybody.